Welcome to 50 Shades of Wealth, Confessions of a Real Estate Investor, the show where you'll learn the real estate investing secrets of the pros. Your host, Sarah Jung, pulls back the curtain and shows you how to build wealth with real estate investing. Welcome to 50 Shades of Wealth, Confessions of a Real Estate Investor, the show where we talk about the good, bad, and ugly when it comes to real estate investing and discuss strategies for building long-term wealth through education and personal growth. I'm your host, Sarah Jung, and today I'm super excited to share with you a very special guest that when I first met her, I was so inspired by her story that I asked her to share her story with you. My guest, Sunitha Rao, is a former professional tennis player and Olympian turned corporate finance professional and residential real estate investor. She started investing while she was actually living in Boston, and she started investing in the Midwest and decided to move to the Midwest, to Indianapolis in 2019, so that she could be closer to her real estate investments and grow her investment business. She has a nine-door portfolio, and over the last two and a half years, she's been working full-time. But what's really, really impressive with Sunitha is that she completed the prestigious Villanova's MBA program despite having only a sixth grade education. Sunitha, welcome. So, wow. When I heard that story about the sixth grade education, I was like, how in the world did you do that? (laughs) So tell me a little (laughs) bit more about you and kind of where have you been? I mean, you have such an interesting background. I mean, you have been in the Olympics. Uh, You have, you're an investor. Uh, You put yourself through your, the MBA program. So tell me, how did you accomplish all of this? <laughs> um, by being very driven and not sleeping very much, I can <laughs> answer in a nutshell. Yeah, it is definitely a, kind of a wild story. It's all been kind of like goal driven. So like dropping out of school before you even finish middle school is definitely not the ideal for anyone. <laughs> but at that point in time, I kind of needed to do it in order to train full time. My entire life was was the sport of tennis at that point. And I was just trying to be the best in the world. And in order to do that, you got to train all day, even when you're 12 years old. So school wow. didn't really have, yeah, much, there wasn't any real room to, to be educated. <laughs> so that was kind of how that happened. And then I turned pro, like officially turned pro two or three years later when I was about 14, 15. And then that was my entire life for the next eight years. So I couldn't, I couldn't go back to school. I didn't have anything else, you know, and um, when I retired, I decided, you know, it was really time to kind of crush some new goals, you know? Mm. So then like you asked about like the MBA program, like I went back to my community college, took some remedial classes to catch up on what I missed in high school, did my best to get through those, got through some of like my undergrad classes, eventually got a full academic ride to a private business school up in Boston, which really, really set me up well for everything that I've taken on so far. And so when did you actually start training in tennis? Because if you're, if you go to the Olympics, I mean, I would imagine you have to start pretty young. Yeah. And especially as, as a female, because females, girls mature so much earlier and can compete with full grown women at a younger age. Right. So like I actually started playing when I was four and it was already kind of like the path that that had been determined for me by my father. My dad really wanted an athlete, especially a tennis player. So like some of my early memories involve like going on runs with him when I was four wow. years old, you know? <laughs> so I was like, I was born and bred to like train and be an athlete and just hustle. <laughs> So you've just known tennis your whole life. So you basically, that's all you knew growing up. And did you have any thoughts? So when you were younger, you know, when you were that little doing tennis, I mean, did you have any thoughts of not that you didn't want to do tennis or you just kind of... Uh, that wasn't an option. So <laughs> I guess maybe I was like a smart kid and I didn't let myself like think about other things. That's the credit I like to give myself. <laughs> but yeah, I, I didn't know any other world other than eating, sleeping and revolving my entire life revolving around training. But you know, like I loved it. I love the act of hitting the ball. I love the act of like getting it past another person. I love being like, even from the time I was young, just being so single-mindedly focused on one thing that like the entire world world falls away. So for me, for quite a while, it was really lovely. But there's definitely like hardships that come with that. So sure. So you went to the Olympics, then you 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 had one up to sixth grade, and then you went back to school. Mm -hmm. Um, What made you interested in real estate investing? Kind of at what point did you 
decide that real estate was something that you wanted to pursue? Yeah. So real estate didn't come into the picture until several years later. So like one of the hardships of being a professional tennis player was a variable paycheck. You know, I, I had to earn each dollar I made by beating someone else and traveling all over the world. And that, that whole lifestyle was really expensive. So when I left tennis, I just wanted like that stable paycheck. You know, I didn't think about anything else other than how to find a way where I could make the most money I could and know how much I was getting every week. I didn't want that uncertainty anymore. And so went to college, got good grades, got a good job, and then realized um, that it's not exactly the same kind of meritocracy that tennis is more of, you know? So when I kind of had that realization, real estate came into the picture because I started studying like how I can influence my future better, you know, how I can take control of my finances and there was so much more opportunity with real estate, like a scalable business model could be built where I could work really hard at the beginning and then have like basically be paid in perpetuity for the rest of my life, you know? And I really liked that because I had worked for so long. I had trained since I was a child, you know, and there's a part of me that kind of wants to relax a little bit one day, maybe. (laughs) We all do, don't we? (laughs) Right. (laughs) So um, that was why I was drawn to real estate. That's fantastic. And then you and then you made the decision to actually move to Indianapolis so that you could yeah. actually manage your portfolio there and, and start working your contacts and doing more networking there in the area. Yeah, if there's if there's one thing I've learned throughout these years, it's go big or go home. So, <laughs> That's actually just, a great I, saying. I love that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's important, you know. So um being in Boston, like I I did start my portfolio there and it was I, I, I was able to find good investments, but it just wasn't growing at the speed that I wanted it to grow at. And I felt like I was missing some competitive advantages by not being local. And the move didn't have to be forever. However, I do love Indianapolis now, surprisingly. <laughs> it's an amazing place. So um, maybe my move is more permanent now. But at that time, I was just like, let me get to a place where I can I can accelerate this and kind of influence my future more quickly, do the work now. And then I can, I can, I can go off and relax maybe a little sooner than if I continued on with the grind in Boston and trying to invest out of, out of state and all that. Right. Yeah. I can see, I mean, out of state definitely has its challenges. Are you focusing on flip? Are you focusing on holds? What, what type of, what type of investing are you doing? What kind of properties do you look for? Yeah, so I operate primarily in the residential space, buy and hold. So of my nine doors, eight are long-term rental. Well, seven are long-term rentals. One one is a house hack I live in and one <laughs> is a short-term rental. So I'm not yet doing like flips or apartment buildings. These are all single families and duplexes. You have such a great running start. Again, I think your background is very impressive. What, as a woman, typically with real estate, there's more men than women investors, just statistically, just numbers wise. As a female investor, do you find any specific challenges, you know, in that space? Or do you find that, you know, there's any difference as far as being a a female investor? Talk to me a little bit about that. I think the biggest area where I found some challenges is just, I think, getting credit for the things that I've done or the things that I'm planning on doing, right? You know, so like, I just find that people some it's more so at the beginning, I think less so now that I have a track record, I've started and I've built this portfolio in like a relatively short period of time on my own, you know, so I, I don't I don't feel like people don't take me seriously now. But I think at the beginning, there was a little bit of the are you going to? That's cute. You know, (laughs) which just made me want to go through a room. I like the term cute. (laughs) (laughs) Like, and it wasn't just, it was people in real estate. It was also people that I knew well, you know, people that I thought were like friends, you know, coworkers. And it was, I, I was getting a lot of the feedback, like these incredulous looks, like, are are you really going to do that? Or outright remarks like who's helping you and um do you have a boyfriend who's like helping you do this do you have people who are giving you money you know how are you doing this you know and when they say people it, it, they were like referring to like family members etc so like until i was able to actually make progress and show that i was a force to be reckoned with it it was a little bit tough to to feel like no one really believed in me you know or no one would give me that credit when 
there would be other people who would be men would just be granted that more easily, you know? And I, I found that to be really fresh. I found that initial part to be really frustrating, but that can be overcome by surrounding yourself with the right people, which I have since been able to do, you know, like networking and finding people who think like you and who are like actual friends as well as, uh, fellow investors. So I don't, I don't feel like I deal with it as much these days. Yeah. And, you know, th- thanks for sharing that. You know, I think that in general, it, it's challenging to be taken seriously, especially when you're a newer investor and, you know, you're calling on owners or sellers or brokers and they may not take you as seriously if you don't have a portfolio or if you don't have a track record or if you don't have experience. And so I can definitely see the challenges in that. And kudos to you for overcoming that. And I think what you mentioned about you know, surrounding yourself with the right people, that is such a crucial component to it because it it can be really, you know, things can get discouraging, especially if you're making offers or if you're trying to find the right property or if you're trying to find the right deal, you know, it's kind of like digging for gold half the time. So when you do find that little golden nugget and you want to make that happen, sometimes, you know, being taken seriously can be a challenge. So you deserve a lot of credit for that. So <laughs> Thank you. Tell me about, so you have, you have all these doors. How do you normally have them funded? Are you financing them? How are you getting them? Use a bunch of different tactics. Okay. So like when I first started, I just had my savings from my W2, you know, and I was doing this at a distance. So I wasn't comfortable and I didn't have enough cash, frankly, to buy anything in cash. So like my first purchase was conventionally financed. I put like the 20 to 25% down, whatever it was, funded the rehab, funded the closing costs. And then I was like, okay, I don't have too much money left. Now what? (laughs) You know, since then I've done some, I I did one more conventionally financed where I had to put down that large sum and then pay cash for everything else. Since then I've done some seller financing. I also house hack since I've moved here. So like I buy a single family on like owner occupant financing or FHA because that's a lot less money down. I just bought a duplex for 3% down. Nice. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. And then like, I'll get one side filled or get roommates, you know, to help offset some of those costs. Also, another strategy I've used is um, using lines of credit. So like, I make sure that everything that I buy has room for appreciation, you know, and then after I do the re and an immediate appreciation, you know, this isn't like in five years, it'll be moved mm-hmm. from here to there because it's a good neighborhood that will also happen. But I make sure that it's like under market. So when I, with that equity, that little like equity that I had in place, that was the buffer between what the bank had and what was, the property was actually worth. After I had like five doors or so, I think it was five doors, I refinanced all of that into a commercial loan and got a line of credit against my business that was tied to that equity. And now I use that equity to like okay. rehab and to fund purchases. Oh, very creative. Yeah, because otherwise just on a trying to do all this on a single W-2 can can be pretty slow. Sure. You know? So I do that. And now I've also started to take on a few investors that are like-minded and I can trust and they trust me. So I'm kind of using, I'm pulling at every string that is possible while I'm not over leveraging myself and still sure. growing somewhat slowly. Cause a lot of people do grow much, much more quickly than I have. Well, and, and you have to go at the pace that you're comfortable with, mm-hmm. you know, cause I think if you go in too fast, uh, that can pose a lot of risk. And, you know, I think just going at the speed that you need to, that works for you is what's important. What do you, well, we can talk about challenges, but since you've been investing, has there been a specific challenge that you've run into in terms of whether it be in the financing part of it or just in the deal finding part of it? Um, Do you find that deal finding is harder than any other aspects or kind of what, what aspect of investing do you think is the toughest? Getting out of my own way. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I think there are challenges across the board. I think for me, I think it's more financing because if I could, I would be growing more quickly, but it's, it's good that I'm not, you know? Um, <laughs> so I, deal finding hasn't been too bad. Deal finding has kept up more or less with my liquidity and the cap, my capital as I've like regrown like my acquisition fund and I've been ready to purchase again. So I really I really can't say too much of that. Although um, finding deals is tough. It's just about like Mm. building your networks, you know? So like I was talking to someone yesterday about finding deals and I was actually thinking through my last couple deals and I didn't actually find any of them. Like they were mentioned to me like, Hey, did you see this? You should go take a look at that. 
you know, whether it was on market or off market. And so, um, and those were all deals that I closed on because building those networks is really, really important in real estate. I've devoted a lot of time to it and, and it pays off. That's great. And, and, you know, we hear that a lot when we're looking for deals out there that it's really about who you know, because you don't necessarily find the deals out like on MLS or just kind of on the listed market. I mean, a lot of these deals, I think you can find directly from the seller or somebody knows about it or, and, and so I think that rings very true. So you definitely validate that. You're listening to 50 Shades of Wealth, Confessions of a Real Estate Investor. Want a free guide to behind the scenes secrets of real estate investing? Head on over to LegacyBloom.com and claim your free book today. Sunitha, so, you know, our show is about confessions and about <laughs> <laughs> confessions of a real estate investor. So to kind of keep in line with that theme, is there a confession that you'd like to share with us? Um, so I think the one thing that I would share, because I didn't anticipate, and I don't think people really talk about this, is the fact that being in real estate is a lot tougher on my mental health than I had anticipated. And I've heard that from like a lot of people, you know? Um, so personally, like I have been diagnosed with severe anxiety. I'm high functioning, but I've got it. <laughs> and it's not, it's not always fun. But even those who haven't like always had like a history of that, like struggle with anxiety and other aspects of um, mental health when it's not at its best, because there, there's just like so much pressure, even if you're not like a type A driven individual, like there, there are so many variables that go into investing and continuing to keep an investment profitable and healthy over the long term. And there are a lot of things that you don't even anticipate and things that cost a lot of money. And it's just, it's not an easy ride, you know? So like, for me, trying to find a balance between what I need as a person and still grow this business amidst all those challenges and variables and those the monetary pressures and stuff and not knowing what's going to happen next. It's, it's, been, it's been a really hard line to walk to make sure I get what I need. Thank you so much for sharing that with us and being vulnerable because I know that's not always easy. With the anxiety, because you know, I'm sure that a lot of us, so many of us can relate with the anxiety and we all have our uh, you know, whether it be anxiety or, you know, our, our stress levels or, or just things that we're dealing with, how did that prevent you or kind of how did that affect your decision making or process that you had to mentally go through when you were, you know, looking for deals or even just like taking action to, to even start acquiring property? So it, it was actually harder after I started acquiring the properties, um, just because there was so much going on and I had the job and then for a while I was in school. So more about like the mental workload of trying to keep everything, trying to keep all the balls in the air mm -hmm. was the hardest thing for me. And, and you know what? It still is because I'm still growing this business, you know? So trying to stay organized and trying not to be too hard on myself, which is actually a little bit laughable because I'm still very hard on myself. That's like, <laughs> like I said, getting out of my own way is like the hardest thing for me, you know? So uh, trying to make sure like I'm in the correct mindset, you know, like I'm doing everything that I can. I'm making the best decisions with the information that I've got. And that is all any person can be asked to do, you know, and just trying to stay organized and not let not let it get to me too much. Set those mental boundaries, you know? Do you have a routine that you go through to help to kind of manage the anxiety and, and kind of on a regular basis? Is there something specific that you do that that helps you? Um, planning things out in advance really helps um, so that like if I know I get things done, then I can kind of allow myself to feel good about that. That is like really important for me. And then also giving myself the flexibility to veer away from like a strict plan and like actually listening to what I need. Like sometimes I don't have time to go to the gym, you know, and you know what, that's okay. You don't have to, you don't have to freak <laughs> out, <laughs> you know, or some days like I just can't get through, through this to-do list. Let's just go for a run and like burn off this excess mental energy, get some endorphins, and then we can try again because you're not thinking really clearly right now, you know? So being able to like be flexible and listen to your body and your mind and address it right away. Is helpful. That, that's a great strategy. Are you still playing tennis? Not as much. Every once in a blue moon, I'll get out there, but I'll, I, I need to be active. Like that part of that part of me hasn't shut down. So there's that's, still a lot of activity. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Sunitha, thanks for, thanks for sharing your confession. And, and again, I know that a lot of people can relate and, you know, and I have to say that 
there's even in my investing career, just, you know, when it comes to that time of just making that decision of if you want to invest in real estate or in how to invest and what path to go, I mean, there's so many different paths you can go. You can go actively, you can go passively, you can go residential, you can go commercial. And so, you know, I think again, like you said, just getting out of your own way and really narrowing down what path you want to take, that's going to work for you. And again, I mean, it is a journey, but I think going on that journey, you have to deal with sometimes a lot of your own demons and uh, to, you know, to get yourself to move forward. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. I appreciate you sharing that with us. What is, is there any particular advice that you've ever received from somebody that really kind of stuck with you and, and that was memorable for you that helped you? Um, I think it was a little bit more like a comment, but I was talking to one of my old professors right before I finished undergrad. He was one of my favorite, he was my favorite business professor. And I was asking him about like advice on entering the corporate world, like resume, feedback, that sort of thing. And he was just, he just looked at me over the top of paper. He's like, you realize that you don't have to be so binary. It doesn't have to be yes or no. There are shades of gray where you can figure things out, right? Like it doesn't have to be set in stone right now. And that was really helpful for me because I can be kind of rigid. And when I (laughs) want to achieve something, it's just like, that is what's going to happen. And that's really helped me in real estate, you know, because it's, it's not about the yes or the no. It's like, how do I make this work? You know, it's making the pieces like shift around so that you can creatively make something happen. And it's not, it's, it never happens in like that predetermined path you you had like kind of set out initially. Well, it's so funny. You mentioned 50, uh, well, the, you mentioned shades of gray and you know, you know, our show is yeah. called 50 <laughs> Shades true. of Wealth, yeah. right? <laughs> so, yeah, that's true. Uh, so just to kind of comment All on the linkages. That. All the, right. <laughs> um, so just kind of comment on that. I mean, there, because it is, it's so multidimensional there's so many different ways to go about things. And so, you know, I think if you're just thinking one dimensionally or linearly, sometimes you can miss those opportunities or you can Mm -hmm. miss different ways of thinking about things. And there's, you know, there, there's so many aspects to real estate that's, that's, you know, just not about just buying and selling and just kind of going through the physical motions. You know, I think what you've been sharing validates that there's so many other aspects to it, which is your mental health state and your, and you know, your state of mind and maybe limiting beliefs you may have about yourself or things that you may be going through that's preventing you from taking the action. And I think uh, what you had shared about anxiety, I think, again, it's very common. And I think we can all relate to that. So I really appreciate you um, being vulnerable here about that. So last few questions, then we'll kind of wrap it up here. Do you have a website or a way that people can reach you? I do. It's griffixpropertygroup.com. That is spelled G-R-I. F F I X Property Group. Perfect. What's your email? Sunita. So Sunita. S-U-N. Yeah. Okay. S U N I T H A at Griffix Property Group. Okay. Com. Perfect. So, really quick. So, is there a book that you're reading right now that you'd like to share, or what's the last book that you read that you thought was interesting? Um, well, I'm actually like. 30% of the way through thinking fast and slow. And I find that really interesting. It's hmm. like uh, the section I'm going through is talking about like what is like automatic decision making versus the decision making that like actually requires like thought and calculation and how, how these thought processes work and influence each other. I think that's really interesting, especially since like I'm an investor and like that does influence the decisions we make when we invest, you know, because not everything is as much as we'd like to think that we are rational, we are not. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're not rational beings. beings. <laughs> yeah, so like understanding like how those processes actually work and how I can be better by better understanding that is, is really fascinating. That's great. What, and what, would you, what would you suggest to new investors that might be listening? Any advice that you can give them? So I actually talk to new investors pretty frequently. I think um, the best way a new investor can set themselves apart, especially when like trying to find vendors and trying to network is to, is to do as much of the work as you possibly can. Um, The people that I feel like struggle more are the ones that haven't truly figured out like their own risk exposure, what strategy that they are comfortable with, like what, which path they need to go. It's basically still like, how do I get out of my own way so that I can tell people what I need? if that investor is still in their own way and and not able to like overcome their um their own hangups it's kind of it's kind of hard because then the questions revolve around like well what should i do you know they're very mm. vague and it's really hard for other people to help you when you don't have that clear cut 
what should I do versus how do I get this specific property? Because this is the strategy I'm looking for because I know this fits my risk exposure. So I think taking the time to, to figure out what works for them and then removing like their own kind of hangups from, from that so mm-hmm. they can clearly state their needs and how they can add value is the best way to set yourself apart. I think that's such valuable advice. And I think there's um, so much of that that uh, we can all apply, whether you're a newer investor or even a seasoned investor. I really appreciate you being with us today, Sunith. I just think that your story is just so impressive. And I was just, again, I was just super inspired by it. Um, and I really hope that the that our listeners are also inspired by it and can you know, feel a little bit more motivated to go out there and, and get that first deal, or maybe you're just going to get another deal if they're already, <laughs> they already have yeah. multiple deals. <laughs> so I really appreciate your time and, uh, I wish you the best. And, uh, you. and you know, if I see you in the Olympics, uh, I don't know, is there any plans <laughs> that you'd ever go consider going back? <laughs> Never. I mean, not that I could. <laughs> I like, I'm old now (laughs) for that, for for that arena. So there's no way, but thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's been great. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Sunitha. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Alrighty. Thank you for listening, everybody. Until next time. Take care. Thanks for listening to 50 Shades of Wealth, Confessions of a Real Estate Investor with Sarah Jung. Make sure to visit us at LegacyBloom.com where you can join our investor club and grab a free copy of Sarah's latest book. And if you like the show, don't forget to leave us a quick review. Be sure to tune in next time as Sarah pulls back the curtain once again and shares more Confessions of a Real Estate Investor.